Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlex here. Got another Master Duel video for you. It is time, once again, for yet another edition of This Week in Master Duel, which is, of course, our weekly series in which we cover all of the happenings, well, this week in Master Duel. Um, we always start here in Clients, and we have quite a bit to talk about in Clients today, uh, as we had a ban list that was announced uh, a couple of days ago, the time that I am recording this. So we'll start by looking at that and other uh, in-client notifications. After that, we will move over to Untapped, take a look at the ranked ladder stats, uh, see how they have shaped up this week and how they compared to the last week. Uh, and then after that, we'll head over to Master Duel Meta. No leaks to look at over there on the site uh, this week. Instead, we're going to look at uh, a few tournament results. So, uh, like I said, we are going to start here within clients and notifications. And uh, the big one that we're going to talk about here are forbidden limited list details, implementation details, changes. We all know what this really means, right? Um, so as always as ever, the cards that are in blue are going down in the number of copies you can play. Cards that are in white are going up in the number of copies that you can play. And this ban list, I'm both excited and disappointed by it at the same time. Uh, I'm pretty disappointed in the cards that got hit, uh, the blue cards that went down a number of copies. Cards that were unlimited are another case. Let's start by talking about the cards that got hit. We're going to start with the card that got limited, Branded Opening. Uh, that is going to be the quick play spell card that upon resolution you send a card from your hand to the graveyard to either add or special summon a Despia monster. And this card getting limited is kind of a joke, honestly. Um, I do think that Branded probably needed at least some minor amount of a hit. Um, but it's not like a, it doesn't need like a major one. I don't know. At the same time, like even when it comes to minor hits, like I feel like Branded opening from two to one is like, who cares? <laughs> when I think of a minor hit, I think of like, well, I guess I was going to say Alibur to one, but that might not be like as minor. Maybe Branded opening to one was the hit because I don't know. Branded is one of those decks where like, it's rather prominent right now, but does it actually need to be hit? Like, is it, like, super problematic? Uh, I think the most problematic thing that Brandon does is puppet locking. Uh, that's more of a tournament thing than a ranked ladder thing, but I do personally still think that Albion needs to be banned. Albion Sanctifier, that is, for that reason. Uh, if we're going to ban Brandon Expulsion, then we just we should ban Albion Sanctifier, too. And, again, uh, people, whenever I say that, are like, but, but Albion Sanctifier has legitimate uses in, in these, like, corner situations, like, all right, you know, your deck is still going to be tiered without Albion Sanctifier, as I've said before. Um, you know, we can't just ban every lock monster because then we're actually hitting casual decks so that Brandon can keep its 29th boss monster. Let's just ban Albion Sanctifier and then Branded players, I know you'll be very sad, but you can attend the funeral with the other Albion and the other other Albion and Lubellion and the other Lubellion and Mirajade and Rinbrum and Granganol and Dragostapelia and literally all of your other boss monsters. It's like, it will be fine. I promise you. But um, yeah, brand opening to one is like... It's not the hit that I want to see in Branded, um, but again, the hit that I want to see in Branded is more addressing the, the lock than, than anything else, right? Um, it's also really funny how, like, people will... Because I've made the argument in the past that, like, oh, you know, maybe this card shouldn't get hit because it's not that competitive. And then people are like, well, you know, if a card is locking you out of the game, it doesn't need to be competitive to be hit. And people will ride that argument until you talk about Branded. <laughs> and then when you're like, well, okay, maybe let's hit the puppet lock because that probably on principle shouldn't ex exist. Then people will pick up the argument of like, well, but it's not even that good on Rank Flatter. And it's just like, all right, dude. Anyway, um, yeah, brand opening to one. Again, not the hit I wanted to see to Branded personally. Super Heavy Soul Samurai Soul Piercer to two. This is the right hit, but the wrong number. Going from three to two, I think this card definitely needed to go to one. And I don't think I am alone in thinking that. Uh, there are still a number of people who are saying, all you gotta do is ban the Link monster. It's like, oh, tell me you play the TCG without telling me you play the TCG. But I don't think that's the hit. Um, I think that Soul Piercer 1 is definitely the hit. Soul Piercer is the card that is absurdly broken because it doesn't have a once per turn, and it's the card that they loop to search a bunch. It's like, it feels like a no-brainer to me to limit this card, um, especially when, you know, with it being at 1, you can call it by it or DD Crow it or banish it in any way, and then Super Heavy Samurai just has a really hard time playing after that, which I think is fine for a deck of that consistency and power level. Um, Soul Piercer 2 is... 
definitely a noticeable hit, um, but I don't think it by itself is impactful enough. Speaking of hits that are not impactful enough, Parallel Exceed to 2. Now, this is somebody who... This is coming from somebody, rather. I'm somebody who is a known math mech enjoyer. I love math mech circular. I love the way it lifts up the math mech archetype. Um, but that card is stupid powerful and needs to go to one. And I can't believe it's still at three at this point in the game. Um, I don't think that Parallel Exceed to 2 was the right hit at all. I actually hate this hit because uh, Parallel Exceed isn't just used in math mech. There are a lot of... Um, kind of Link and Xyz base decks that can make use of it. Uh, I'm thinking of Trap Tricks, um, there have been like Springins variants that I've, I've toyed around with where you can Parallel Exceed to go into a rank 4. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just not a good hit. <laughs> I really don't think it is. Um, I really don't like hitting uh, more generic cards because I think it's really cool to be able to cook and build like piles. And I think Parallel Exceed is one of those like, it's one of those pile deck cards that I am a huge fan of, right? Um, because again, it's a pretty unique case where you would want to be Link Summoning and also going for a rank 4, but it's not so unique that it's like inconceivable or only that only one deck is doing that, right? So to semi-limit this card because of Math Mech when Circular is still at 3, I, it's just like... Come on, like, I, I knew that Konami didn't want to hit URs, but to that degree, really? It's just like, come on. Um, oh, let me address this now because I, I see this comment. I've seen this comment a couple of times for like some reason. People were like, how did they not hit Snake Eye? It's like, yeah, Snake Eye just came out. They never hit decks that just come out. We got to wait for a deck to, you know, the pack to leave the shot before there's a realistic shot of the deck getting hit. Um, as far as what to hit in Snake Eye, I think based on based on the rarity spread more than anything else because again with Pearl Exceed, Konami like very very clearly for the millionth time making their stance that they don't want to hit UR cards. The fact that Poplar's a UR, the Abel Star's a UR, Original Sin's a UR, and Wanted is a UR kind of makes you think they're going to end up hitting Snake Eye Ash which to be fair is also the deck's main starter so I think limiting that card and also um I think limiting that card is also a good thing because, you know, Snake Eye already has trouble when Snake Eye Ash gets, like, negated, right? A lot of the time, um, they just can't play throughout the rest of their turn. So, I think limiting their starter that's already a little bit vulnerable is probably the best way to curb that deck's power level without uh, ruining the engine applications for other decks. Because I do like the Sinful Spoils engine. Um, it's It's... It has a lot of the same appeal to me that the Adventure Engine does, which, hey, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but I like, I, I don't mind an engine that's powerful and can support a lot of decks, as long as it's not, like, stealing the identity of those decks. And I don't think that Sinful Spoils does that, but I do think that Snake Eyes does that. I really realize this a lot when playing Snake Eye TG. It's like, you know, and, and, and to a similar extent when Theory Crafting uh, Snake Eye Rescue Ace, too. Honestly, a lot of the time, I just feel like I'm making... I don't feel like I'm making a cool new pile that can do things that Snake Eye or the other archetype couldn't. I feel like by adding the other archetype, I'm making the Snake Eye deck worse. Um, because ultimately, the Snake Eye lines are still going to be, like, the best things to be doing in those given decks, right? Like, TG Snake Eye is the one that I have a lot of experience in, and... While Calamity is like a very powerful card and doing a bunch of synchro summoning, in my opinion, is really, really cool. Um, at the same time, you're just opening your combo line up to getting hit with Droll or Nib uh, and making yourself really weak to those cards where Snake Eye normally isn't. So, you know, um, it, it's why I like decks like Sprite and Tri Brigade a lot is because I really like that they can lift other archetypes up without stealing their identity, right? Like you know, sprite variants will still end on their archetypes variant. Like, Gishki sprite ends on Gishki cards. Um, ironically enough, Tri sprite ends on Tri Brigade cards. Um, and then same with Tri Brigade, right? Like, Tri Brigade Lyralisk ends on Lyralisk cards. Tri Brigade Harpy ends on Harpy cards. But TG Snake Eye, while having a bunch of plays involving TGs, if you're doing the main optimal line, you're still just doing Snake Eye stuff. Um, anyway, I don't know what got me into that whole tangent there. But, um, so yeah, again, as far as the cards that are getting hit, Brand opening to one is like, as a minor hit, I guess I understand it, but I don't think it was the right hit at all. I don't think Brandon needs consistency hits. Uh, I think they just need their big problem card that locks stuff uh, taken out. 
Uh, Super Heavy Samurai Soul Piercer. Uh, I think this was a good hit, just the wrong number. Really need to go to one. Two is not nearly as impactful. Parallel Exceed the two, completely disappointing. It should have been circular to one. I, it, I was going to say, I don't know why it wasn't circular, but I do. It's because it's the UR. All right, let's talk about the stuff that got unhit. Water and Chase was at the temple to two. Finally! Actually, I could say finally to literally all three of these changes, but Water and Chase was at the temple to two is huge. I really like the adventure engine, um, and I think especially in this particular meta, it has there's a lot of decks that can use it to very great effect. And I also don't think that it's necessarily uh, any more powerful than anything else that any other engine or deck is really doing right now, especially with both Enchantress and Right of Armasir both at two. I think that's 100% fine. Um, long gone are the days where, you know, uh, adding the Griffin Rider to your board made it like super duper oppressive. Um, I mean, of course, adding an Omni to your end board is very, very good still, um, but yeah, I, I think the deck is definitely, the engine rather, uh, is definitely fine with Water Enchantress being it too. And I'm very excited because I love the Adventure Engine and I play it in a lot of stuff. King of the Swamp, going from 1 to 3. Um, you know, I was going to make a joke about how this card never even needed to get limited in the first place, and I would definitely think that there's even still that argument to be made. But I will say that this matters a lot more for tier limits than it might look like. Um, I have come into a couple of situations where I'll be like test or like theory crafting tier limits, and um, I realize like how good polymerization and in turn King of the Swamp would be for the deck, right? Um, indeed, if you open uh, Rhino Heart along, if you open King of the Swamp alongside Rhino Heart, then you are guaranteed, no matter what you mill, to be able to end on Roll Colos plus the Fusion Graffa at bare minimum, uh, which is, is pretty good. <laughs> you know, that's not too shabby. Um, so, like, not only just being a Fusion Material Substitute, but I think also making the polymerization more accessible because, like. You know, at the same time, I was, I'm not exactly trying to jam three polys in, in a tier limit deck, but three King of the Swamp and one or two polymerization is a a much, much better um, case to be making. Uh, also, King of the Swamp being at three means it's more likely to be milled, which also makes the Fusion Graffa a lot more viable for tier limits. Don't sleep on this unlimit. This this is a huge buff for tier limits, which were already a pretty good deck. Like, I would say that tier limits were already a very firm tier three deck. Um, and I think with King of the Swamp coming to three, we might even see it shoot back up to tier two. Um, Oh, we'll just have to see how things play out. Uh, especially with Kikolo still being around, right? And the ability to mill... Um, I was going to say 5, but with the tier cash, it's 10 a lot of the time. The ability to meet mill 10 means that you'll have a King of the Swamp in the graveyard if you're playing 3 more times than not. Which, again, makes those fusion substitute cards like the Fusion Graffa uh, a lot more accessible. So... Um, yeah, that's that's a huge, and again, also just being able to make Polly a lot more consistent. This is a huge buff. This is a pretty big buff for tier limits. Don't don't sleep on this. Uh, Prank Kids Meow Meow Moo. This is, whoo, this is huge as well. Prank Kids are finally back on the menu. Um, if you're ever wondering what happened to that deck and why you randomly don't see it anymore, it is definitely because Meow Meow Moo went to one uh, that was very very impactful for the deck. Um, really, Meow Meow Moo being at one meant that Prank Kids honestly just had no amount of follow-up, right? Like, if your turn one got disrupted, or if you even if you went off and your board got answered, which really wasn't that big of a stretch given that a lot of the time Prank Kids is ending on not much more than Battle Butler and like maybe a negate in the form of Wandering Griffin Rider. Um, so it's like, yeah, you can do multiple board wipes, which is still pretty good, but, you know, especially as power creep goes on, it becomes easier and easier to play through. So, um, yeah, the fact that you would just have no options left after your opponent either disrupted or played through your turn one as prank kids was definitely not that good. <laughs> but Meow Meow Moo is finally back to three. I was afraid this card was never going to get unlimited. Um, so between that and Water Enchantress, like, you better believe that prank kids are back on the menu. Um... I don't know, like, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to claim that, oh, they'll be Tier 1, or honestly, even 2 again. I can see a world where maybe they're Tier 3, but in my opinion, they'll probably more likely be, like, a rogue deck that you'll see a lot more often in the meta than you did before, which was never, because, again, Miyamobu being at 1 was really a death sentence for the deck, um, in my opinion. So, alright, 
pretty small ban list. It was definitely smaller than I expected. Also less impactful than I expected. Like, usually we go in a pattern of small ban list, big ban list, small ban list, big ban list. But, um, yeah, we just had a small one. And I feel like this was another pretty unimpactful one. We will be having a Duelist Cup next month. That is worth noting. So I think between that and the fact that we've had a couple of small lists leading up to, you know, the next one here, I would expect the next ban list to be a lot more impactful than this one. Hopefully. We'll see. But, um, yeah. Uh, I think that, again, the hits, the cards that got, you know, reduced the number of copies you can play are meh, not great. Uh, the unlimits, though, are mwah, beautiful. Love all three of them. Okay, we also had a new gate added to solo mode for Eldlich, the Cursed Golden Land. So, uh, some more icons, or, or I guess rather just uh, accessories for our favorite golden boy. And some gems, 200 more gems for everyone as well. Got a survey for February events, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, got a new tryout duel, time travel back to 2004. An event where you battle with cards released in the OCG until November 25th, 2004. Um, this actually doesn't say whether or not we're going to use that ban list, but I would assume that you would. Uh, this is basically going to be GOAT format. The GOAT format, the event. Um, as somebody who's played both in GOAT format back in the day, um, and also played GOAT format like historically, right? Like gone back and like revisited the meta. Um, I think this era of Yu-Gi-Oh is like... A total snooze fest. I think it's really, really boring. Uh, I think if you're gonna play this kind of Yu-Gi-Oh, you honestly might as well just play Magic. Like, um, it just the 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 crawling pace of the game and the way the interactions go is just like, uh, I don't know. I, I I don't think it's a bad for it. Do I? Do, am I willing to say that? No, I don't think it's a bad format. I just don't really like it that much, honestly. I I just think it's it's very boring. Um, like. Even Edison, which I do love, I love as a format, there are certain games in Edison where I'm like, oh my god, this is taking forever, it's a total snooze fest. Um, and I feel that way about pretty much every game in GOAT format. Plus, I don't think GOAT format decks are particularly interesting, honestly. Um, like, not only the GOAT decks themselves, but even stuff like Panda Burn and uh, Empty Jar, it's like, I don't know. Although I think the this particular band list might even have Magical Scientist FTK, which is like even less fun. <laughs> I don't know, it's just it's always funny when you hear Yu-Gi-Oh members complaining about how like, oh Yu-Gi-Oh nowadays is all about FTKs and playing the same staples, and it's like, did you not play the game back in 2004? Well, I mean that's the thing, right? It's like, you know, the game at this point in time, like and a, from a competitive standpoint, did always have FCKs and decks being, like, literally 50% staples, if not more. Um, but, you know, the people who say that it wasn't like that are probably just referring to Playground Yu-Gi-Oh! The truth is, when it comes to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh!, the things they complain about, FCKs and the presence of staples, have literally always been factors, so. Um, yeah, I don't know, plus it's also a tryout duel, like... On principle, I don't think tryout duels are worth the time. <laughs> I really don't. Like, um, three wins, not even three games, three wins for one pack is, like, such a huge ask. It really is a big ask. Um, and this format in particular is just not interesting, I don't think, personally. But anyway. <laughs> I'm sure people will have something to say about that. But, uh, anyway. Uh, is that just a reminder, I guess, for the, the Sword Soul campaign that that's going to be ending relatively soon? Um... There was also a correction for the dual pass here, but I didn't... I didn't I, these these are exactly the same, aren't they? Oh, no, I see that. Oh, my God. Oh, they they accidentally implied the dual pass would last half an hour longer than it actually does. Ooh. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do understand why they have to clarify that, but it's like, that's not that big of an update. Okay. All right, I think that does it for in-game notifications here. Let's pop on over to Untaps, where, um, as always ever, I'm going to be looking at the, particularly the popularity and win rates for Platinum to Master. I feel like that tends to be the most relevant range as far as, like, gauging what the Ranked Ladder metagame looks like. So... Uh, just like last week, we are seeing that Vanquish Soul is still uh, above all the other decks, but it's not quite as above as it was before. Uh, we see not only Snake Eye, but every other deck is definitely catching back up. Uh, Vanquish Soul last week, from what I remember, was closer to like 60%. 
win rate, and then Snake Eye and everything else is like 55. Um, well, I guess it's more that Vanquish Souls win rate is kind of like drops down to 58.6, but also Snake Eyes has risen from like 55.5, like I think it was, to 56.3%. Also seeing a 1% increase in popularity as opposed to the last week as well. Um, I think a lot of other stuff in the meta is like pretty much where you would expect it to be. Although Snake Eye is eating up a lot of the pie here, I think all things considered, we're in a fairly diverse meta right now. Like, especially if you, like, look at all these decks here in the, like, 51 to 55% win range, which is generally about, you know, what you would expect a Tier 2 deck to be. Um, you know, Tier 2 going on, of course, you get closer to 55 Tier 1. Uh, there's a lot here. I mean, there's a lot that is viable in this meta, right? Um, there's even multiple different, like if you're confused about the multiple branded variants, branded Despia is what you would like more typically think, and I think branded Bistial is more like branded Synchro, right? But, um, yeah, I mean, just a lot of stuff that's viable in this meta right now, which is really, really cool to see. Uh, again, it's really easy to be like, oh, but Snake Eye is eating up so much of the pie, which, which it is, I'm not gonna argue against that. Um, Snake Eye, I think, is definitely... Probably just the best deck in the meta right now. Um, and it's probably, I'll end up putting it at the top of the tier one slot when we do our tier list, which we are in fact going to be doing um, probably tomorrow, if I had to guess. Or we'll do our our tier list for all the different meta decks there. But yeah, I mean, everything else is about, I think, where, where you would expect to see it. Except tier limit is actually a little bit lower than I would expect to see it. Although this is plat to... Master, not just Master. One thing that I think is really cool on Untapped, by the way, that uh, I haven't quite mentioned yet, is that it will show you a rank distribution for the deck in question, right? So you can actually see how much it's played in each individual rank. So, you know, Snake Eye, we see it mostly in Diamond and Master, and of course in Plat too. But, you know, as opposed to if you go down to like, you know, Blue Eyes and Dark Magician, you, you'd almost never see it in, in Diamond or Master, um, but Plat and Lower, you'll see it quite a bit there. Um, but even then, there are still, it's not quite as simple as like, oh, bad decks you play in low rank, good decks you play in, in high rank, right? Um, as even Phantom Knight, which is a relatively low both win and representation rate, does get more and more popular, in fact, at its most popular within Master rank. So it kind of makes you wonder, you know, if like, it's always interesting, these stats, because although the stats themselves are fairly objective, uh, the implications behind them and, you know, the conclusions you can draw are still rather subjective, right? Like, you know, fans are not having a rather low win rate, uh, despite being at its most popular in Master. So it's like, okay, you know, people who are relatively skilled at the game are playing this deck. Is it that it can't stack up with other decks that are more played in Master like Snake Eye? Um, or is it that it's just seeing such a low... Uh, play rate that it's also seeing a low win rate who knows you know it, there's so many different factors there but i do think it's really fascinating to take a look at here um it's funny how infernoble was like super duper hyped up and is like you know barely above a 50 percent win rate but that does also make sense to me because it is a more complicated deck i would expect this win rate number for this deck to go up gradually over time right like as people just get more and more um, skilled or learned with the deck, uh, I think that this win rate number for them, the popularity number, I don't think will necessarily go up. It might even, it'll probably just go down over time. But I think the win rate number will then gradually go up as well. So yeah, I mean, again, like I said, we're pretty much about the same place we were before. Let's actually see what happens if I bring it up to Master. Wow, Snake Eye 27.7. Although that's still only about 2% higher than we saw it last week, but... I mean, the numbers are honestly still, as far as, like, win rate goes, about the same as they are plat to master, it's just the popularity rate changes, right? Which, again, makes sense, so. Neat. Okay, there is what's going on on the ranked ladder at the moment. Uh, now, let us go ahead and look at some tournament results. Gonna start with the Master Cup number 33 about a week ago at this point. Uh, 90 players, single Elan, best of three, uh, was won by Brandon Despia. Makes sense in, uh, makes sense for two reasons, right? In best of three, we tend to see Brandon Despia doing a little bit better. Also, I know that April is a pretty good Brandon Despia player, so makes sense for two reasons to see that in first place there. Uh, we got Snake Eye coming up next here. Ugh, with three Nibiru. I, I've talked about this a little bit lately on both streams and the Discord server. I, I can't stand when, like, yeah, this came up a lot in the last event, but, like, I can't stand when, like, every deck is on three Nibiru in a format. It's just, like, beyond miserable to me. 
Um, but Nibiru is actually pretty good in this meta. A lot of people kind of tell you that it's not because of Flamberge Dragon, but really it just involves good timing of when to drop the Nib. Um, but Nibiru, I definitely do not think it's a bad card at all in this meta. Got another Snake Eye list here. This one on Small World, which is pretty interesting. I speculated that Small World might be uh, good in Snake Eye, but I haven't really seen too many people on it. Um, but every now and then we see it come up, which is, um, yeah, it's cool. Oh, so this list is on two field spells, which I thought about playing before as well. Uh, ooh, looks like this is Snake Eye Mech Knight, which is cool. I love any deck that's got a Soul Synchron in it. <laughs> I'm a sucker for any deck. Although I hate any deck that, oh, I hate this card right here, One Day of Peace. That's, uh, actually literally probably my least favorite card in Yu-Gi-Oh right here. <laughs> so... Uh, Rika Sun Avalon sticking into the top cut here. We got another Snake Eye list here. Some more Snake Eye action going on. And Math Mech looks like he's going to be bringing up the last slot there for the top eight. DK Meta Weekly number 101. Uh, single Elim best of three. No side decking though, as always as ever. Uh, had 175 participants, as you can see. Still mostly Snake Eye, but... It's still not as bad as, like, Tier Limit was, honestly, as far as, like, how much of each of these, uh, tournament top cuts it's eating up. Did get first place here with a, honestly, very standard-looking list here, uh, mainly playing the Droplets, um, which makes sense at the same time, because it's something I've said, you know, if you're anticipating playing against a lot of Snake Eye, then I think it's almost better, or not just a lot of Snake Eye, but I think in this meta in general, right? board breakers are a little bit more valuable than they were just because as far as what hand trap is good is so dependent on what matchup you're playing right like if you're playing against snake eye then valor and imperm are, are pretty good uh but if you're playing against like um super heavy samurai then all of a sudden those cards aren't good but droll is really good against that deck but droll isn't good against snake eye so when you have a bunch of like hand decks that have conflicting hand traps or like you know you know what i mean uh decks that have conflicting hand traps that you want to play against them sometimes it can be best to just turn to board breakers uh and in terms of board breakers i think Dropwood is probably just the best one uh mostly for its ability to be played both going first and second i think it makes it very very good Oh, did I also see a Trisbania in there? I did. That's cool. Uh, Trisbania is a pretty good card um, with the IP Masquerina. I think it's a pretty good target for it. So it makes sense to see that there as well. Some more Snake Eye action happening here. We got Kashtiras in top four. It makes sense because this deck is able to uh, counter a lot of what... Um, the meta wants to do right now and this looks like a particularly going second build with three lava golem as well as two kaijus as well um again yeah board breaking i think is very very good in this meta all right got another sink eye deck on three droplet there and another tournament top from april wow congrats with branded despia there got naturias naturia runic still Despite Runic Fountain being at one, still a mainstay in the meta. And one, if you look at the untapped results, uh, that still gets a pretty decent win rate a lot of the time, too. Despite seeing so little play. 54% for an 0.7% uh, play rate is very, very good. Okay, we're on this one here. Uh, got another Kashira. Again, Kashira, very, very good deck in this meta. Same with Vanquish Soul, which this is not. No, I thought this was Vanquish Soul because I saw the Curry Kara alongside the Kashira cards. I was just assuming I would see VS stuff, too, but nope. Oh, they are playing three-dimensional Fissure, though. This is what I would call a going first card, right? Like, how evenly is a going second card? I think this is definitely, like, a going first card. That is to say, I think a tech like this makes a lot more sense in best of three than it does in best of one. With a black wing kind of extra deck here, yeah, that's funny. Alright, got some Monadium, branded Monadium here. Uh, got more Snake Eyes, more Snake Eyes here. As well as Dinomorphia sticking into the top 16 along with Math Mech here as well. Um, let's see, some more Sick Eye action there. Oh, could Stellar Knights manage to get into the top cut here as well? That's cool. Hell yeah. Another Monodium list here, and there we go. Sick Eye Tier 0, we need to hit Brain and Math Mech then. Sick Eye is not Tier 0. I think the next comment below that even said the same thing, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's not tier zero. It's very, very good. It is by far the best tier one deck. I will not argue against that, but tier zero, nah. No, 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 no. 
All right, here we have the Cola Cup, 131 players. This one is best of one Swiss rounds, which means this will end up being a little bit more representative of what is good on ladder, uh, as far as like the tournament results here. We do see a lot of snake eyes making the top cut here, uh, as well as one winning, but wow, that's quite the snake eye list there. It's Snake Eye Vanquish Soul, that's also playing in for Noble Knight Riccardetto. That's pretty interesting. Wow. Oh, because it's a level one fire monster. That's also a warrior. That's cool. Oh my god, we're playing the Braver? Oh, that's sweet. Oh, because we can use it to search the Durandel? That's I would love to see this deck in action. Holy shit, this is a this is a rather interesting snake snake eye of Anguish Soul and end up winning the whole tournament as well. Got Tier Elements taking second place here with a little bit of a Monodium package as well. That's cool to see. Ah, oh, yeah, this list. I mean, you know I'm, I'm here for this list. Hell yeah. Title Sprite. And one of the things, so I've had people suggest playing Title in Sprites before, but one of the things that I wanted for the deck if I was going to try it was another good level 2 water monster. Uh, and I think this person totally nailed it with Cardahan. Um, yeah, it's a level 2 water that can special summon itself, um, and by being able to special summon itself and being a level 2, uh, can go into sprite plays very, very easily. So it definitely makes a lot of sense, like, I imagine a lot of the time we're trying to send, like, maybe the frogs or nimble angler with the title, but having the 2 card hand not only is something good to send in hand, but also having another good target in the deck as well, um, makes a lot of sense, so... Hats off to this sprite player. This was um, this is a really really cool list. Very very cool. And another tier limit list actually in the top four. So this was a pretty top cut in particular. This cola cup, although it was largely snake eye. None of the pure snake eye actually made top four. So we got to see the snake eye vanquish soul list as well as the two tiers and the sprite list. Hell yeah, hell yeah. That's awesome. All right. And finally, we have the China Master Duel, Taiba Weekly, number 73. Uh, this is 113 players, also best of one Swiss for the six rounds of, well, of Swiss there. So, got Snake Eye with the Cashier package winning out here, uh, with Brandon coming up in second place, despite this being in a format where, at least again for the Swiss rounds, um, you know, I mean, Brand is still good in best of one. It's not inconceivable, but it is definitely more favored in best of three. So, another Kashira kind of snake eye list here for top four as well as wow! Look at this one. This is a uh, this is quite the pile here. This is sixty card uh, giant ballpark super heavy samurai synchron. With an all synchro extra deck. That's wild. That's so cool. <laughs> I love decks like that. That's so cool. Uh, we got Mikanko Infer Nobles in top eight, as well as. Uh, wow, our first lab deck. Although it's not even pure lab, uh, it's actually Lab Adventurer. Uh, lab Adventure Phantom Knight, which is really, really cool. Actually, is it even Adventure? No, there's not even Adventure stuff happening here. It's just Lab Phantom Knight. Another really cool pile deck there. Uh, we got here another Snake Eye list. And Earth Machine. Earth Machine. Always nice to see Earth Machine doing well. Getting top eight here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I always I, I like to make this point whenever I see decks like this doing well in tournaments. And I think it definitely stands to reason here. There are a lot of people out there who will act like the existence of whatever deck is currently popular in the metagame, uh, this flavor of the month is Snake Eye, is keeping their favorite rogue deck from doing well. And I gotta say, if you're spending all your time espousing that online, the current meta deck is not keeping your favorite rogue deck down. You are keeping your favorite rogue deck down. Because we see it time and time again, uh, these decks that you wouldn't expect to do well or see in Master or top tournaments will do so. Um, and it's not because, like, again, the stupid argument that people will make, like, oh, oh, a, a, a rogue deck topped a tournament. This tournament must have been full of bad players. It's like, 
No, that's obviously not the case. Um, it's just the case that, um, you know, rogue decks are better than a lot of players will give credit for. And your favorite pet deck can probably see a good amount of success if you are uh, willing to not only dedicate the time to uh, learning it in and out, but also maximizing the build and preparing it for the current metagame. It's also funny to me that the, the kinds of players who will decry, um, it's just it's just funny to me that players will decry, you know, rogue decks that do well in tournaments, while at the same time also saying, like, why don't rogue decks do better in tournaments? It's like, gee, I wonder what the correlation could be here. Hmm, who knows, whatever. But, um... Anyway, uh, that's going to go ahead and do it for this week in Master Duel. Hope you all found the information here helpful. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and just move now to our outro. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video, that means a lot to me. Uh, it's also a great way to support the channel, so thank you very much for in that way as well. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways, uh, like the very special patrons that I am thanking here, uh, you can do so by checking out some of the links in the description, one of those goes to the Patreon, uh, where you can join these fine folk and support the channel that way. I do post daily content over on Patreon, so uh, you do get something for supporting there and if you're interested i also have a coaching tier option uh, as well details again will be on patreon in the link below uh, also in the description linked below is my twitch page where i stream uh, a few times a week you can go ahead and check that out follow or subscribe over there uh, if you ever want to catch me live uh, you'll also find my second youtube channel if you feel like subscribing over there to watch some of the twitch vods as well as some additional uh, non Yu Gi Oh related content that I make over there. Uh, again, any of those links you want to check out is all a great way uh, of supporting. But again, even if you don't do that, just watching was also a fantastic way to support. And once again, I have to thank you so very much. But uh, in any case, this is Hexlex. I'm going to be signing out and I'm hoping you have a fantastic day.